Keep it going for Esteban and this perfectly adjusted mic stand. Oh, this is exciting. I'm not used to receiving all this attention. This is kind of overwhelming because I'm an introvert. We got any other introverts here tonight? <laughs> See, I was kind of hoping I'd be alone. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the main reason I tend to shy away from other people is I'm scared of being pinned down in a bad conversation with a stranger. You know how that happens. I always have a hard time figuring out an escape plan. I was at a friend's birthday party and I was talking to one of his coworkers. And with no context, this guy referred to himself as a big foot guy. <laughs> and my anxiety spiked. <laughs> because in front of me, I saw two conversational paths, one of which I did not want to take. <laughs> it is possible what he just said is, I'm a big foot guy. And that I'm okay with. I've got time to speculate about Sasquatch. <laughs> That's a fun conversation. But my fear is that he said he's a big foot guy. And look, pal, I just met you. I don't want to talk fetishes. Let's maybe get to know each other a little bit first. Anyway, it turned out it was neither of those. He hates the metric system. And that is the worst of any of those conversations. What a boring subject. Now I really needed to get out of there. So I asked him if I could sniff his sneakers. <laughs> and he started inching away from me. I'm going, to, I'm going to become a little vulnerable here and share something a little embarrassing about myself. I'm a professional wrestling fan. That, that quiet support was appreciated, but sometimes people give me a hard time. They ask why I haven't outgrown that yet. I think it's the nostalgia that keeps me invested, because I used to watch wrestling with my father, and those are happy memories. And on really special occasions, he would actually allow, allow me to choreograph my own beatings. <laughs> All right, you're covering your face? Don't. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't you dare. It's actually pretty cool. How many kids get to say they've been spanked with a folding chair? <laughs> to the head. In a steel cage. At the terrible report card rumble. And here's the best part. I know my father really loved me because even after I lost, he would still give me the belt <laughs> and call me champ. That felt pretty good. I, I really appreciate you all being here tonight. This is about as good a situation as I could ask for. Sometimes I have to perform in less than ideal situations. Like occasionally I'll get booked to perform with a band. And that can be kind of hard because I find people generally like music more than comedy. Next to co musicians, comedians are the less hot sibling of entertainment options. That's why musicians have groupies and comedians have strained relationships. <laughs> Last summer, I was performing at a street festival and I had to go up after a Journey cover band. Do you know how daunting that is? Because everyone loves Journey and everyone does not know who I am. So I knew I was gonna have to grab that audience right away as soon as I got on stage. And I'm racking my brain with what I can say. And I'm watching the band. And then the singer dedicated their last song to his stepson. And I knew exactly how to open. <laughs> I had the perfect line. I went up, I said, give it up for the band one more time. Can you believe that guy plays in a cover band and is a stepdad? Does he just refuse to compose original material? <laughs> See, that's a good joke. That got my show off to a good start. I thought I crushed it, but what I hadn't accounted for is that musicians are a little bit more sensitive to, to roasting than my comic friends are. Because after the show, in the crowd, I spotted fake Steve Perry, and he did not look happy. <laughs> he came at me like a midnight train going anywhere. And I knew he was mad because he gave me that dad poke to the sternum. Although I suppose in this case it was a stepdad poke to the sternum. <laughs> and he told me he didn't appreciate me talking about him in my act. He said, how would you feel if I got up there and I played a song making fun of you? And I said, well, that would probably hurt my feelings, but first, wouldn't someone else have to write and record that song? <laughs> That's how that works, yeah. <laughs> I got him pretty good. And then that dork went home to a family that loves him. <laughs> I, uh, I end up in so many unpleasant exchanges that I'm starting to think maybe it's me. 
I was at the gas station on the way over here, and I was paying with my credit card. And uh, I didn't like this exchange. I put my card in the chip reader, and the cashier told me I needed to put it in harder. <laughs> That's not a thing I like hearing. But what can I do? I put it in harder. Then the cashier told me to put it in deeper. I don't even understand that. It's different from harder. But I'm a people pleaser, so I put it in deeper. And then the cashier said, maybe try spitting on it and swiveling it around a little bit. And I said, are we still talking about my credit card? <laughs> I had to make clear. I was like, look, this is all feedback I've never heard in the bedroom before. Because there I always pay cash. <laughs> or Venmo, Bitcoin, whatever doesn't leave a paper trail. It's, uh, it's good we're all able to be out and together again. Uh, I'm glad we don't have to wear masks anymore. And I wasn't too upset about the mask mandate, but I didn't like the period afterward where every business had their own set of rules for masks. It started to feel like a real etiquette issue. I learned to just start treating masks like condoms. <laughs> if I walk in the room and everyone else is wearing one, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll put one on too. That just seems fair. But if I walk in the room and no one else is wearing one, maybe I should put one on. <laughs> Seems like a good idea. I'm, uh, I'm from Milwaukee. That's uh, where I was born and raised. It's not as impressive as it sounds. I've, uh, I've learned something about Milwaukee. When I go out of town and anyone finds out where I'm from, there's only three things people want to talk to me about. Uh, either beer, cheese, or Jeffrey Dahmer. That is unfortunately our claim to fame. It's like the national perception of Milwaukee is it's so bleak there, the only way to cope is by either drinking your feelings, eating your feelings, or eating your neighbors. <laughs> Which is why you never want to trust someone who's sober and lactose intolerant in Milwaukee. <laughs> I, think that, uh, I think it messed with my head a little, the whole Jeffrey Dahmer story, because I was in like sixth grade, and that's a scary thing for a kid to hear about. And I confided in my cousin. I told him I was scared. And I asked, what if this guy gets out of jail and comes and kills me? And my cousin said, you don't have to worry about that. He only kills gay guys. And then I said, OK. But then I asked myself, what if I'm gay? <laughs> and that's the first time I've ever had that thought. And to this day, I can't be entirely certain if my heterosexuality is the product of nature, <laughs> or if Jeffrey Dahmer scared me straight. <laughs> And I'm going to admit, it messes with my head a little bit knowing Jeffrey Dahmer might have played a role in my psychosexual development. <laughs> I think it's made dating a challenge for me in a way. But I think the thing that's made dating the hardest for me is I'm just not a dog person. And that rules out a lot of people. There's a lot of women with dogs. But I just can't do it because I'm not a dog person myself. I can't appreciate what that animal means. You know, the last time I dated a woman with a dog, I came over early once. And she had done that move where she'd spread peanut butter on herself. And the dog was licking it off. And I just could not condone that at all. Because how come he gets peanut butter? I'm just supposed to go down there for the love of the game? That doesn't seem fair. I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna try to leave on uh, just something good, some good thing we can all think about. <laughs> We've talked a lot about a lot of upsetting stuff, but here's some, I think one thing we can all do, very easy to make the world a better place, listen more, listen more closely, pay attention. Because I've made a lot of false assumptions over my life, and when I find I really listen to other people's perspectives, I understand where I got it wrong. One day, one of my coworkers was upset, and I asked her what the problem was. She told me a guy on the street had just called her the worst thing a man can call a woman. And I said, oh no, he called you the C word? That's what I've always understood, is the number one thing a man doesn't say to a woman unless he's basically declaring war. And she said, no, worse than that. And I said, what could be worse than the C word? And she said, ma'am. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. <laughs> because I call women ma'am all the time. I always thought it sounded polite. But when I heard her position, I understood that when I say ma'am, I think it sounds polite. What well, women hear sounds like, hey, excuse me, pardon me. You dropped your glove, you uptight old hag. <laughs> That's the last thing I want to say, you know? That's the problem, though. Ma'am is culturally permissible. Women are going to be called that all the time, regardless of how they feel about it. But the C word we've learned to save for really special occasions. 
It's like fine china. You don't bring it out unless you're trying to impress company. <laughs> like, imagine if a guy calls a woman the C-word on the street in front of a group of people. She can tell him off. They're all going to have her back. He's obviously in the wrong there. But if a guy calls a woman ma'am in front of that same group of people and she yells at him, she's going to look like a total cunt. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been a blast. I've been Chris Schmidt. Keep it going for Esteban. <laughs>